Hey everyone, uh, good to be gathered here again and um, looking forward to jumping into Luke chapter 4. Just wanted to mention briefly um, that um, Cynthia is doing well. The surgery went as, as good as expected and she's now on the road to recovery. So on behalf of Roger and Cynthia and the family, thank you for your prayers. Continue to pray for them and um, and just, yeah, that God would be with them and, and be their strength, be their peace, be their protector in all of this. And so thank you. And um, also wanted to mention that if you're on the uh, church email list, you, you've been receiving emails that Steve has been sending out on my behalf. Uh, he, he titled them Pastor's Ponderings, uh, whether you like that or not, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But um, I just felt led to kind of go through Philippians and to provide these little bite-sized devotional nuggets. And so that's really the basis of that. If you don't get that email and you're interested in obtaining those devotionals, uh, as I said, they're bite-sized, they're not massive, it's, it's a fairly short read, but um, uh, I've just been sharing some things that God is putting on my heart as I've been walking through uh, Philippians. But you can access that through our Facebook page, so One Love Church Sydney on Facebook, and also we've started to upload those into our Instagram page as well. And so uh, I think the tag for that is onelove.church. So if you're interested, you can uh, check those out and just track along with us, One Love Church Sydney um, or onelove.church. If you're not sure, just go to our website, onelovechurch.online, and you can get details from that as well. Okay, so we're picking up in Luke chapter 4. Today we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 13. It's an interesting passage and, uh, and one that I'm very excited about. Um, <clears throat> as we look at this text, uh, you know, the, the, the first thought that comes to mind is spiritual warfare. Now, I didn't feel compelled to do an exhaustive study on the subject of spiritual warfare. We've done that before. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can go back to our website and find the details of where that is located. But uh, I just wanted to kind of obviously cover the subject of spiritual warfare, but look at it in light of the text and what Jesus dealt with. And so uh, it's not an exhaustive study of spiritual warfare, but it is a study as it related to Jesus, what he went, to, uh, went through, and, and how it relates to us and, and how it applies to us. And so I want to begin... Uh, by just kind of looking at something and, and, and really sort of setting, setting the foundation for how we're going to approach this. The Bible speaks of a term that can be confusing to the uninformed. It's a term that Christians throw around quite a bit and almost seems commonplace among us, but among other places, we find it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, where John the Apostle writes, Do not love the world nor the things it offers. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. That's the term, the world. But what is John talking about? Because I love surfing. I love the beach. I love the ocean. I love the waves. I love it. I love to get there. It's, it's refreshing to me. It's, it's an outlet that I have. But since I love these things, does that mean then that I'm void of the Father's love? Is that what John is telling us? No, that's not what he's saying. The world John is referring to isn't necessarily nature or creation. It can be, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about ungodly philosophies, sinful passions, and evil things that would motivate and compel the unbelieving world to pursue pleasure apart from a relationship with God. It's this pursuit of satisfaction apart from God. The world here speaks of life without God. That's what John is talking about, and that's what that means. Now, all humanity is born into that world. We're all born into it. That's why we must be born again if we wish to experience life with God. The whole purpose of Jesus' coming was to create a bridge from the world to the kingdom of God. He's our redeemer and he offers redemption. That's the bridge. That's what we cross over to enjoy life with God. And when we're born again, we cross the bridge into the promised land, so to speak. But 
there's a part of us that still longs for the sinful things of this world. And if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. It's this magnetic pull. Our sinful flesh desires the sinful things of this world, and the sinful world constantly appeals to our flesh. This is what Paul was talking about in the book of Romans chapter 7. The things that I want to do, I, I don't do. But the things that I don't want to do, I find myself practicing. And he's talking about this struggle, this inner man, this inner turmoil that we, uh, we feel drawn to the things, the sinful things of this world. And we all deal with it in one way or another. John explained uh, this a, a little bit more in detail as he goes on in 1 John 2, verse 16. He said, For the world offers only a craving for pleasure, uh, excuse me, for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and our possessions. Now that's from the NLT, but I, I like how it renders it. Notice again, the world offers only these things, only a craving for physical pleasure, only a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. And he concludes saying, these are not from the Father, but this is from the world. We all have physical needs. We do. And we crave things to meet those needs. When I'm hungry, I crave food. And there's other physical needs that we possess, and we, there's cravings that come with those needs. And God made us that way. But when it's a craving for a sinful thing, well, John refers to that in other translations in uh, 1 John 2.16 as the lust of the flesh. We also notice things that look good or beneficial, and we crave these things because they think they'll help us or satisfy us. John calls this the lust of the eyes. And we also have emotional and psychological needs, needs to be accepted, needs to succeed or progress. But when we crave recognition for what we've achieved and, and, and for the things that we possess, well, that's the pride of life. That's what John was talking about. Now, here's where the devil comes in. He uses the things of this world as the weapons in his arsenal. Jesus called the devil the ruler of this world, and, and, and he rules over this sinful part of this world. But he knows your needs. He knows your desires. He's studied you intently. He knows you well, and he offers just the thing that appeals to your cravings. So you might have cravings that I don't have, and, and vice versa. But the enemy knows those things that you desire. He knows the cravings that you have, and he offers the thing to appeal to that craving. And so often it seems like it's the answer to your dilemma, the fulfillment of your desire. And so it's appealing, it's enticing, it's alluring but it's a baited hook, and the moment you bite, you're snagged and caught in sin. Listen to how Dietrich Bonhoeffer described uh, this relationship between our desires and the world. It's, it's fascinating. I'm gonna read it slow, because there's there, it's a big quote here, but listen. He said, in our members, there is a slumbering inclination towards desire, which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. And all at once, a secret smoldering fire is kindled. The flesh burns and is in flames. He says, it makes no difference whether it's a sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power, or greed for money, or that strange desire for the beauty of nature. Joy in God is being extinguished in us as we seek all our joy in the creature. Interesting. Joy in God is being extinguished in us as we seek all our joy from the creature or creation. At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality. 
and only desire for the creature is real. The only reality is the devil. Satan here doesn't fill us with a hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. So true. And now his falsehood is added to this proof of strength. The lust aroused envelops the mind and will of man in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. And it is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. Wow. When our desires lead us away from God, our enemy has succeeded in causing us to forget about God. Our desires have usurped the sovereign Lord. Now, the devil uses the things of this world, those things that appeal to our sin nature, to tempt us and to lure us away from God and from his plans and purposes for our lives. That's what Jesus was facing in this passage when he was tempted by the devil. And this is what continually happens to you and me if you're a child of God. See, as Christians, we're not only the children of God, but we're ambassadors of Christ. We're heaven's representatives. We're holy travel agents whom God uses to get people excited about knowing him. And Satan is adamantly opposed to this. So he's ever lurking in the shadows and looking for opportunities to derail our faith and destroy our testimony of Christ. That's his number one objective, is to destroy the work of God. And God is doing a work in your life, and God desires to do a work through your life. Therefore, Satan is out to get you. That's why it's imperative we know how to counter the assaults of our enemy. We need to know how to counter the assaults of our enemy. There are things we can do to withstand temptation, to keep us from sinning, and to continue in victory. This is why Luke included this story in his gospel, I believe. So we would realize, first of all, that Jesus can identify with the enemy's tactics and with the warfare that we all face and that we're dealing with, but also so that we would realize that Jesus was victorious. He overcame and he provides us an example to walk in victory. That's why Luke wrote this. So let's pray and then we'll jump into it. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for your word. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now Luke picks up where he left off back in verse 23 of chapter three. You know, we looked at the genealogy of Christ last time. But prior to that, in verse 23, it says Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. And now he resumes that line of thought. And he says, And Jesus, verse 1 of chapter 4, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when he and when with excuse me, and when they were ended, he was hungry, it says. Now after Jesus' baptism, Mark chapter 1, verse 12, in the story of Jesus' baptism in, in the wilderness, Mark says Jesus was immediately led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. So right after he was baptized, immediately he's led into the wilderness. Now, let's go back to his baptism and touch on that for a moment. His baptism, where he heard the voice of God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he experienced, he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit when the Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. That was a mountaintop experience. Just think for a minute what that would have been like. Put yourself in Jesus' shoes there for a minute. I mean, I remember when I was baptized, that was a joyous occasion. I was so stoked. But not only that, to hear the voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and then to receive this anointing of the Spirit of God, that was a mountaintop experience, a glorious experience. But it was immediately followed by a descent into the valley, the wilderness, 
teeming with wild animals, we're told, where he ate no food for 40 days and was tempted by the devil. What a contrast. Welcome to the ministry. Welcome to the family of God. Here you go. This is what we can expect. God's people, regardless of calling or position, experience the highest of peaks and the lowest of valleys. We, we do. It's just part of it. Both are necessary, though, for our spiritual growth and development. G. Campbell Morgan said this, and I've shared this before, but I love it. He said, God made us for the mountaintops, but he makes us in the valleys. Let me say that again. God made us for the mountaintops, but he makes us in the valleys. God made us for the mountaintops. We're meant to go to the peaks. We're meant to meet with God, to sit with God, to hear from God, to cry out to God. We're meant to go there where we fellowship and have communion. And that's not necessarily a physical place, though a physical place can certainly contribute to that destination. But it's more of a, a spiritual place that we get to go to, and we do go to when we meet with the Lord. And he brings us to those mountaintops. But then we come down the mountain, and we interact with sinful humanity, and it's there in that interaction that sometimes those valleys get really deep and really dark and very low. And it's in those places where God helps us to see our, our sinful tendencies, our struggles, the, the things that are gripping onto our lives, the weights that are weighing us down. It's in those places where God illuminates our perspective of ourselves and leads us to surrender that part of our life so that we'll walk with Him, so that we'll run our race without being hindered. Both are necessary for the child of God, the mountaintops and the valley lows. Jesus is now in his descent. He's in the valley. He's in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. He's hungry, it says. Mark tells us that there's wild animals all around. That would have been scary. And add to that that he's dealing with temptation. He's dealing with temptation. Now, if the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, then it was God's will for him to have this experience. God led Jesus to be tempted, to be tested, to show what kind of Messiah he would be. What do I mean? Well, would Jesus be a self-seeking, glory-mongering Messiah? Or would he be a humble, God-fearing Messiah? How would he come through these temptations? Now, we already know the answer to that, and God certainly knew the answer to that. But this was the reason behind his wilderness experience. It was for him to go through this, and as I said earlier, to identify with the struggles we have, the temptations and the sinful tendencies and the things of that nature, but to show us that there is a way of victory, that there is a way to overcome because he overcame. Not only that, but from this experience, Jesus identified with the nation of Israel and with individual believers. See, notice, Israel was tested in the wilderness for 40 years. So Jesus was tempted in the wilderness or tested in the wilderness for 40 days. And as the Spirit was present with Israel, so he is present with Jesus. And Jesus quoted every time from the book of Deuteronomy, which was God's covenant book with Israel. So where Israel failed when they were tested, Jesus succeeded. He also identified with believers. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, In every respect, Jesus was tempted as we are, and yet he was without sin. Now, this enabled Jesus to become our sympathetic high priest. He knows what we're going through, and he can relate. Now, this doesn't mean Jesus experienced every temptation we do, but the areas of temptation, or the categories, if you will, of temptation. As I said, 
John describes it best in 1 John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the areas that Jesus dealt with, the ways he was tempted that we read about here. Those are the categories that he was tempted in, in all points as we are. See, he was tempted in ways that we never will be tempted. <laughs> we'll never be tempted to turn stones into bread. Have you ever been tempted to say, I'm going to turn this rock into a loaf of bread? No, no that's just not possible for us. And he could not be tempted in some ways we are. Jesus never married, so he wouldn't experience the temptation of committing adultery upon his wife. But he was tempted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, one other thought, it's important to know that God cannot be tempted by evil. James 1.13 tells us that, which means God cannot sin. In him is light, there's no darkness at all. God cannot be tempted by evil. So on one hand, Jesus sinning was never going to happen because he's God. But as a man with a human nature, he could feel the full weight of temptation and he wrestled with the urge to cater to his flesh. Even though he was never going to go there, he could feel the weight, he could sense the urge. This is why and this is how he could sympathize with us. But that brings us to his first temptation which was in the area of physical need or the lust of the flesh. Look at verse 3. The devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Now as I mentioned only a short time ago, Jesus heard the voice of his Father. You're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He heard his father say that. But now he's hearing another voice suggesting a course of action to meet a legitimate need. His need for food was legitimate. He was hungry. But whose voice is it? Is it the father or is it the devil? In your time of temptation, have you ever wondered whose voice you were hearing? Who is that speaking to me? Who is that telling me this thing? Is this the Lord or not, we might wonder. Jesus was hungry. He hadn't eaten for days. But it was the Father's will to meet that need, and he would have, and he did. But the devil suggested that he take matters into his own hands. See, in those moments of weakness and vulnerability, it can be difficult to discern the voice of God, especially when we're in need and there's an apparent solution being offered. Hey, there's the answer, but is that of God? Not only that, but the devil is challenging the Father's claim, isn't he? This is my beloved Son, said the Father. If you are the Son of God, prove it. Prove it. Turn these stones to bread. Let's see it. And if you are his Son, and he truly is your loving Father, then why have you no food? Wouldn't your Father be providing for you? So there's a temptation to doubt the love of the Father. There's a temptation to validate his identity as being the Son of the Father. Jesus was tempted here to use his miraculous powers to feed his hungry appetite and to validate his identity. Now let's look at this a little closer. The devil was saying, you have a right to do this since you are the Son of God and you're omnipotent, you're all-powerful. If you truly are the Son of God, you have all power. So then, why don't you just turn these stones to bread and feed yourself? You have a right to do that. You're hungry. Now, that seems harmless in and of itself, doesn't it? I'm hungry, and I have the ability to do something about it. I may as well just do it. 
but he was urging Jesus to act independently of the Father, which would have shown his lack of trust in the Father. I can handle this on my own. I don't really need you. That would have been what he was saying, but Jesus didn't go there. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And the context had to do with God providing manna for Israel when they were in the wilderness. See, every morning, except on the Sabbath, there was a fresh batch of manna. And each day, the Israelites had to trust God. They had to exercise faith in God. They had to go out, believing God has provided, to obtain their supply of food. They had to believe God's promise, but also his instructions for their daily provision. They had to do this each day. And on the sixth day, they gathered enough to carry them over the Sabbath. If they followed his instructions, that is, they walked by faith, well, then they would live. They would live. Therefore, they did not live by bread alone. So Jesus is saying, yes, I could make bread and I could eat to prove to you I am who I am. I, I could do that, but this is not God's will. This is not God's way. He will provide for me in his timing and he will unveil my glory when it is his will. I don't live by bread alone. Matthew adds, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. I'm trusting God and relying on Him. Now, one last thought. Jesus clearly discerned who was speaking when the suggestion contradicted God's word and presented a course of action that was contrary to God's will. It's important we know the truths and promises of God. So when we're confronted with an option or a course of action, we know who is speaking. We know where it's coming from. And when we know the truth, we're able to withstand the lies and stay the course. The second temptation. This had to do with getting what you want without hardship and struggle. It's the lust of the eyes. And we see this in verses 5 to 8. Look at it. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to Jesus, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't argue against him and say, who are you to offer this to me? You have no right. You have no authority. He doesn't argue. Later on, Jesus would call him in John 12, John 14, John 16, the ruler of this world. At any rate, the devil, we're told in Matthew, took him to a high place, a high mountain, and he showed him in a vision the whole world. Somehow in this vision, Jesus was able to see all the kingdoms of the world. And, and the devil, being the ruler of this world, he offered to hand it over to Jesus if he would simply bow down to him. Now, throughout the Old Testament, in several places, it's prophesied that Jesus would rule over all the world when the Father exalted him to do so. So Jesus knew this. He knew this. So the offer wasn't anything he wasn't already going to receive. There's nothing new about this. He was going to already receive this rulership, this authority over all. What the devil is offering is a shortcut. You don't have to experience the hardship of ministry life, nor endure the painful sufferings of the cross. Just bow to me and I will give it to you. And the implication is that this isn't a an ongoing submission to the devil, but even just a, a once, a one-time event. Just 
bow your knee to me and, and I'll give it to you. Now, it wasn't only a shortcut, but think about this. The expectant people of Israel who longed for a conquering king to dominate the Romans and hear the opportunity for Jesus to obtain that, that was a massive temptation. I can have it all now. I can bypass the struggle and the suffering and the death. I can appease the cries and the demands of a weary people. I can set this in motion now if I simply bow the knee. Jesus could have his kingdom the easy way and he could ease the burden of the people. Think of all the good Jesus could have done for the people, how he could have delivered them from this heavy hand of oppression and provided for them in many ways. But this was the way of compromise, making a deal with the devil and becoming one with the world. This would have been an earthly and sensual utopia, but not an eternal kingdom. Jesus would have turned his back on his father, upon his calling, and he would have established his kingdom by selfish means, not according to the will of God. But it was not to be. Now Jesus had already identified with sinners at his baptism. He knew his path was a lowly one that involved suffering. He knew his crown would come as a result of the cross. And in this, he rested. And for this, he trusted. He had eternity in mind, which was far different than the earthly suggestion. So he replied to the devil's offer, saying, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Again, quoting Deuteronomy, this time chapter 6, verse 13. The context there had to do with Israel when they entered the promised land. Moses warned them not to glory in themselves and not to forget God. And he reminded them, Moses that is, reminded the people to worship the Lord their God and to serve him only. And unlike Israel, because they failed, Jesus remained submitted to God. He would not take matters into his own hands and he succeeded where Israel failed. The third temptation had to do with the pride of life. Jesus could expedite the plans of God by presenting himself to Israel. Notice what verse 9 says. And the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So the devil led Jesus to a high point of the temple compounds. Some suggest it was the southeast corner of the temple. Where he again questioned his identity. If you really are the Son of God, jump! God said he will protect you. God said he will keep you safe. And the devil quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. But what he's saying is, if you jump, the angels will protect you. And if Jesus did jump, they would have protected him. But he's saying, if you jump, they'll protect you. And rather than falling to your death, you'll safely land on the ground and everyone will see and know that you truly are the Son of God. You can prove your identity by fulfilling Psalm 91 and by displaying your power and authority. Now talk about a grand entrance that would have been. That was nothing like riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. This was an entrance fit for the king, the king of kings. Just jump off. The angels will cut, usher you down and everyone will see and marvel and know that God is here. 
But Jesus would not introduce himself with a show of force, but by proclaiming and teaching the truth, which is what he did all throughout his ministry on earth. By proclaiming and teaching the truth and by doing signs and wonders, but not for himself, as the devil was suggesting, but those things he did for others. He wasn't about to put God to the test here. Yes, the word of God does say angels will protect me, but that doesn't mean I should go around jumping off temples to see if God will keep his word. <laughs> and so he answered the devil, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. See, to receive acceptance by the people and to, to be embraced as their Messiah without going to the cross, that would have been very appealing. To shortcut the will of God would have been appealing. If I can obtain the reward without the suffering, then I win. This is great. And isn't that what we all desire? If we can be saved while sinning under the grace of God, well, then I'm winning. I get to enjoy the pleasures of sin and know that I'm, I'm saved for eternity. If I can produce church growth by telling people what they want to hear, well, then I'm winning. The church is growing. I'm sustained. Everything's working. People are coming. I'm only telling them what they want to hear. If I can obtain results and rewards without waiting on God, without the agony of being patient and waiting and wondering, then I win. But this is putting God to the test living how we want to live without regard to the presence of God nor to the will of God. Jesus knew the Father was with him. He knew that his plans would be carried out in his timing and in accordance to his will. And therefore he said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is not in accordance with to God's will. This is not a part of his plan. Therefore, I will not do it. In verse 13, we conclude, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now the implication here is that even though Luke recorded only three temptations, there was likely a barrage of temptations during the 40 days in the wilderness. So the devil didn't just tempt him three times. He might have tempted him in these three ways, but over and over again. But he would have experienced a lot of temptations during that time. And after the devil ended every temptation, notice what it says. He departed until an opportune time. He left him alone for a little while, but he would come back. Our enemy doesn't rest nor sleep. There are no holidays for the agents of evil. They're always there. They're always watching. They're always throwing darts. They're always whispering lies and false promises. They don't stop. And they're always looking for and waiting for an opportunity to pounce us. So how do we overcome this? Well, it's important to know, first of all, that you've already won. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have tribulations. But take heart. Why? Because I overcame the world. Because I have overcome the world. Take heart. You're going to experience this stuff, but the victory has already been won. I have overcome. That's why Paul, the apostle in Romans chapter 8, after naming a whole bunch of troubles that Jesus was referring to. He said in Romans 8, 37, in all these things, in all these troubles, in all these tribulations, in all of these, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. We're already victorious 
We are more than conquerors. We've already come through. We're already in the place we long to be. We already have the victory. Now there's a sense of peace and confidence of knowing we're on the winning side, isn't there? It sits well with the whole idea of eternal security. I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm in Christ. I've already won. That's good news. Not only that, but Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And that's a lot of stuff that God has given us, and it includes weapons, strength, and the ability to overcome the attacks of our enemies. I want to look at three weapons briefly. God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. This includes weapons. The first one, we see it here in the text, which is the Word of God. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 calls the Word of God the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword? It's an offensive weapon. It's what you use to combat, to fight, to overcome. We use the Word of God. We wield or yield the Word like a sword. Jesus countered the enemy's attacks with the truth of God's Word every time. The temptation came, it hit, and he immediately swung with the Word of God and he overcame. Now, if Satan is the father of lies, according to what Jesus said in, in John 8, 44, then everything he says is rooted in lies. It might sound good. It might feel right. But is it supported by the truth of God's word? Does the word of God support it? Does the word of God condone it? What does God's word what do God's promises say about that thing presented to us? Another powerful weapon is prayer, according to Ephesians 6.18. Prayer is inviting God to intervene in our affairs while trusting in His will, trusting in His timing, and relying upon His power and His provision. That's what prayer is for us. And it's a powerful weapon because we're inviting God to act on our behalf. We're inviting God to intercede and to intervene into our situations. We're inviting God to answer and do the work. And if God be for us, who can be against us? But then there's fellowship. That's the third thing we notice from Scripture. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says something that's probably familiar to you. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now we often, you know, hear that verse associated with men's fellowship and things like that. And, and that's fine. It, it, it works. But think of it this way. Would you prefer to enter a battle with a butter knife or with a samurai sword. You're not going to do much damage with a butter knife, but you might do a lot with a samurai sword. Iron sharpens iron. It makes you sharp. Fellowship with other believers, it sharpens you and it enables you to cut down the enemy's assaults. It gives you strength, it gives you power, it gives you ability. That fellowship does. This is why, and I want to read this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now think about that. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let us consider one another, not forsaking the assembling together. In other words, it is so good and it's vitally important to be gathering, to be meeting. Now, 
this is the terrible situation at the at the moment with our current lockdown because we're unable to to meet lest we face a barrage of fines from the government but we can meet in other creative ways and may we endeavor to continue to fellowship with one another because by so doing you're encouraged you're built up you're sharpened and you're able then to withstand the attacks that come your way from the demonic forces that are working against you. Now all of these, the Word of God, knowing it, submitting to it, prayer, exercising it, fellowship, engaging in, all of these come under the banner of submitting to God. And listen to what James 4, 7 says. James 4, 7 says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now we have to recall what it's saying. We often hear that phrase, resist the devil and he will flee from you. <laughs> but that's not all the verse is telling us. It's saying, first of all, submit to God. You have to first submit to God if you're going to resist the devil. And when you submit to God, then you can resist the devil. And when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. See, Jesus here didn't just recite God's word. It's not just a mechanical recital. Well, the word of God says this. That's not what he's doing. He's stating it. And by stating it, he was declaring its authority over his life. This is what God says. I believe what God says, and I'm submitting to it. The devil then left him. And when we pray, we cry out to God. We're submitting to his authority, and we're inviting him to be actively involved in our lives. And when we do this, the devil flees. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Watch and pray. And by doing this, you'll avoid falling to temptation. And when we're fellowshipping with believers, there's strength in numbers. And God is present in that gathering. There's a unique ministry taking place between the Holy Spirit as two children of God are being vulnerable with one another and sharing with one another the things that the Spirit of God is instilling or speaking to their hearts. And, and there's this, this presence of God that's unique. And I, to be honest, I, I can't explain it. I don't know how it works. The Bible says when two or three are gathered, there I am in your midst. And some say that, you know, that has to do with judicial um, arrangements, you know, carrying out church discipline. And I get the context of that. But it doesn't escape from the idea that there's a unique presence of God amidst two or more people gathering in the name of Jesus. And when we do this, guess what? The devil flees. So when we believe the word of God and we submit to it, the devil flees. When we pray and cry out to God and submit to him, the devil flees. When we fellowship and share in the things of God together, the devil flees. This is how we overcome temptation. This is how we continue in victory. See, like it or not, you and I have an adversary who hates us. I don't like it any more than you do, but it is the reality because the Bible tells us so and because I've experienced it enough. And our adversary, the devil, and his cohorts, they know you well, and they know which strategy works best to defeat you. They know the bait to use to catch you. So we've got to be prepared. We've got to be committed to Christ. We've got to be
consistent with the things that God has set before us to do. Hey, if you have a Bible, you have a weapon. If you have a voice, you have a weapon. If you know one other believer, you have a weapon. You have tools to use to overcome the wiles of the devil. Use them. Use them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you, God, for your grace that, that floods our lives. And through your grace, Lord, you enrich our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would not lose heart, that we would persevere, that we would recognize that you're working in and around us in ways that we're likely not even aware of. And so help us, God, in spite of our struggles, in spite of the opposition, in spite of the trials and the temptations and the difficulties we're, we're dealing with, help us, Lord, not to lose heart, but to seek your face in every way we can, that we might bless you and honor you, and that you might work through our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I pray you have a blessed day today. If you have questions, please get in touch with us. If you need prayer, please let us know. If you need anything, I, I get it. We're in another four weeks of lockdown. It's terrible. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I want to get out. I want to enjoy freedom again. And so if you need anything, you're struggling through this, hey, let us know. Reach out. Talk to somebody. We're in this together. It's a, it's a cliche phrase, but it's reality. And so let's minister one to another. Let's work together for the glory of God. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.